Joined now by Tuesday regular writer for the Province and Post Media, baseball maven, Gordon Lightfoot fan. <laughs> Patrick Johnson. Sorry for your loss, first and foremost. See you tweeting about Mr. Lightfoot, Canadian treasure. Yeah, I mean, he was, uh, I think my mom had the Lightfoot with like the exclamation point, like album. And uh, yeah, so I, for some reason, I was I was a huge fan of it when I was a kid. And <laughs> uh, yeah, Steel Rail Blues, man. I was, I, I was talking to uh, someone uh, yesterday uh, who was mentioning to me that Canadians really had an outsized effect on the folk scene. Huh? When you think yeah. of Lightfoot yeah. and Cohen and Mitchell yeah. and Ian Tyson, like on and on yeah, it went. Yeah, yeah. And they're all the song, and they were all the songwriters too, right? Like, right, that's the other thing. You know, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Paul Anka. There's another a one, folk, but yes, yeah, yeah not okay. folk so he was per a, he was a big se, but on that era. Yeah. But he, he was, was a big, huge, huge songwriter. Yeah, huge, huge songwriter. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, in my hometown, there's a Paul Anka Boulevard. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, uh, moving right along here to the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, we're going to start with them. You've heard of them, I'm sure. Uh, first of all, the Bodog poll question, should the Canucks feel embarrassed that the Kraken have bypassed them so quickly, Patrick? Yeah, of course. I mean, you're a longstanding team. You were once at the pinnacle of the game, and here you are, never playing playoff games, despite that being your stated interest. So, yeah. And, I mean, the, 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 <laughs> the fact that the Kraken, I mean, the Kraken, I, I, you know, misfired their first team, but they're an expansion team. And, you know, what? coming in the wake of Vegas was probably never going to be fair. Um, but the fact that they, they, they hit their sort of, they hit the back half of their round, you know, like they did in, in last summer and figuring, realizing how they really needed to do in goal and realizing that, you know, Jer, you know, or realizing that Jared McCann was going to be a guy that was going to progress and hitting, hitting on Matty Beneers. And, you know, they, they've, they've progressed well. There've been some step one to step two to step three, you know, you know, so Can I, Can both I, things I, be true though? Can we, did they both do a good job and miss the boat on getting a couple of the marquee players that were available to them mm-hmm. in the expansion drive and uh, then trading those guys away yeah. for yep. more picks? For yeah, sure. I think, yeah. Whether it was Tarasenko or whoever, yeah. um, you know, yeah, there, there were definitely things they could have done. They, I, you know, I think they should have done, but they didn't do. Um, and so, yeah, they, you know, they weren't optimal. Absolutely. I don't think anybody, there's very few cases of being optimal. I mean, would you call yes. the, would you, the Leafs have this, have actually played a ton of hockey. They've won a ton of games and they find it, but it took them forever to win the first round. Like, had they done it right? You know, on the other side of things. Um, but I think there's, there's clearly a way to kind of go in the right direction and there's clearly a way to spin your wheels. And I think we, I think people yeah. well know what we Sports think of how things are thing. We deify the Colorado Avalanche one year for doing it all right and figuring it all out, and yeah. then the next year they're bounced. You know, like sports. This is why we like it. Like you don't yeah. know the plot line. You don't. Yeah, and, and certainly you know you look at the Lightning, and I, I this is not I don't buy into this as demeaning it, but you know here are guys who won in the bubble, which were teams that had you know there was not every team had the same interest in playing. I mean they all showed up. But but not everybody was as incentivized, and so they won in a weird environment. And then the next year, um, you know, they they kind of threaded the needle again. And but but winning the Stanley Cup is really hard. Like that's the thing, and mm-hmm. that's the lesson. And you know, yes, getting in now is a difficult thing. Um, but but as ever, the thing is not to just get in the dance; is to be good enough to advance. It, you know, sure sure, there are no clear favorites necessarily year to year, but but getting in and having a chance uh, is a different thing than simply getting in. And sure. that's what yeah. these teams are doing. On Colorado, I would say, I think you can argue, look, uh, some of this is bad luck. Landis Gog and Nichushkin are very good players, and they and they missed, well, in Landis, Landis Gog's case, the entirety. Mm-hmm. Of the season. Some of it is when you're a Stanley Cup champion, your depth gets robbed, right? People come looking for your players, and I think a little bit of that. And I think, you know, uh, the goaltender, of course, uh, Kemper was good enough last year. I'm not sure the goaltender was good enough. As for the Kraken, I think that's, you know, the fact that their first season was such a catastrophe almost makes it worse look on the Vancouver Canucks that in one short year, and remember the Canucks won the first yeah. couple of games this year as well. They had won six straight against Seattle, and yeah. then yeah, 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 yeah. the Kraken took off on them. Uh, and, and part of that may be the fact that they structured their team to be able to go out in free agency last year and get guys like Jones and Schultz and Bjorkstrand and Burakovsky because they had they had cap space. So 
brings me to the first round, Patrick Johnson. What sort of lessons have we learned? I believe you penned on this recently. And uh, yeah. where are you on the just get in and anything can happen, <laughs> my man, well, after a Sunday unlike any other in the history of the Stanley Cup playoffs? You know, I mean, I was in the story. I, one of the people I talked to was Brandon Sutter, who said, you know, in the end, he's been he's watched more hockey playoffs, I think he said, than he ever has. And and he's on the sort of get in and anything can happen kind of train. Um, but most we, players are, right? Most players like players are sort they, of we, have to condition themselves in that regard on either side of the ledger, whether yeah, you're abs- a, a one seed going, we can't take these guys lightly, or whether you're an eight seed going, we got yeah. a puncher's chance here today. Yeah, and, and and part of what we discussed, you know, what we were talking about was was the idea of of – you can control, you, you can only control yourselves, right? So, like I said, well, you know, like, for instance, in the bubble, do you think you guys, you know, how much did the fact that the Wild didn't want to be there, you know, probably, and the Blues were kind of worn out, and it was a long year, and maybe they weren't so pumped. I mean, O'Reilly was incredible. And he was just like, well, whatever. Like, I can't care about that. Like, all I know is that our team played really hard, and we earned those wins. And, and, and that's sort of the that's the mentality these you know players come in with right so so the idea that yeah we can do it anything's possible but they will also i'm you know in the end the better team is going to have the better chance um and so you want to make sure your team is set up as best as possible to push um you know i think it was a you know you look at how this yes there were a couple upsets right but you know in the end from year to year the top you know, the final four is almost always three of the four. You know what I mean? It's like a top team. It's not like we're getting, you're getting extreme outliers. And even years with like, say the blues, or you go way back to when the Kings knocked off the Canucks in the first round. I mean, the Kings had a wasted first half of the year and then came out flying the second half of the year. The blues like clearly needed a total complete reset of what they were doing and were the best team in the league in the second half. You know, like it wasn't, it wasn't like there was a total fluke that this was just a team that snuck in, you know, which, which is, you know, I think has felt like has been too often the approach. If you just sneak in, oh, maybe we'll pull off an upset. And maybe we'll pull off an up. Maybe we'll pull off an upset. Like you want to have a team that's in it, in it, not not just to like have an extreme case where this is, you know, this is the this is the miracle run, the Cinderella run in in March Madness or something like that. Like this has to be a sustainable thing because you're playing seven game series. Like it's not like it's not a flip of a coin. The shorter the series, the bigger chance of an upset. But the reality is, the reason why it gets harder and harder and harder is because the teams, most teams get through, most good teams get through, and the more hockey you play, the more likely you're going to get worn out. And that's the simple. Kraken in the playoffs next year? Well, can they sorry. replicate this? Can the Kraken yeah, replicate well, just yeah. yeah. I think, you know, it was, it was, it was funny. I was talking to Brad Schlossman about this, you know, who covers North Dakota um, in, in Grand Forks, and he kind of made a, he kind of made a comment. He said, I think people checked out too quick on Dave Haxtell. Like, like mm-hmm. he actually, Dave Haxtell had two really good years in Philly. Right, like he made the playoffs both years. He had yeah. winning records both years, and then he comes back and he's working with Ryan Hextall. And we, I think, you know, I think the, I, I certainly hope that the historical understanding of Ron Hextall has been thrown out the window because you know there was this notion, oh, he's a bit different. He's a hockey man, but he's a bit different. Well, I don't know if Ryan Hextall ever knew what he was doing. And you know, in the end, he go, comes back. Hextall gets fired. He's the guy left to kind of blame as if as if he was the problem. And mm-hmm. um. He clearly wasn't because he's had to, you know, he he figured it out this year. Didn't have a great first year last year, but the whole team didn't play well. The whole organization didn't go great. But this year has been a good story. The team clearly is firing in the right direction. They found a whole bunch of things, and he seems to be a coach who understands how to how to sort of manage this group of players forward. Unquestionably, uh, I think it's been proven that the dysfunction with the Flyers was not Dave Haxtell and no, much, no, but no. Uh, the, what, there were other the forces at work. Yeah. There. right. The happenings, yeah. uh, the happenings above him. Uh, switching gears, Patrick, last week we were talking practice facility and then uh, lo and behold, the Calgary Flames shortly after we finished our discussion went ahead and announced what um, they're doing with regards to a, yeah. an arena and a practice facility. And that got you on the blower yeah. with uh, the mayor's office at City yeah. Hall and then the staff of Ken Sim. What, what did you find out? Well, I thought I should at least, at very least, see if we can put this on the record that Vancouver still stands as a place that's not, you know, if. If in the hypothetical future, and I don't think there is a future where they're actually going to build a new arena, but just as a hypothetical, was is there any appetite at all for any kind of public involvement? And it was, I mean, it wasn't a hundred percent no, 
but they're basically like, it would have to be a pretty compelling case. And they're pretty skeptical that there is such a thing. So yeah, if, if we were to see a new sports arena sometime, I mean, I don't think there's one coming in the near future anyway. Um, partly because, or mostly because honestly, the location Rogers arena and BC place are currently in is pretty hard to beat. There's only one spot that maybe is better. And that's the, that was where the white caps wanted to build their stadium over the, over the rail yards over in, over in gas town there. Um, but, but other than that, you know, the people say, well, what about like Wally or, you know, that kind of, you are like the reality is the stadiums that work in North America, almost anywhere in the world are not the ones that are out in the burbs. They're the ones that work that actually have proven to be positive amenities for the community or the ones that are downtown, the ones that people can walk to, the ones that are not heavily dependent on having huge parking lots around them that keep people in the area that, that uh, incentivize mm-hmm, yeah. people to stick around. And that's, that's the thing. So, you know, I don't, I, I, I did ask the Canucks about whether they, you know, what are their plans? I mean, we know that there are little projects in the works here, here and there. They're, you know, they're trying to enhance some of the, some of the sort of VIP areas, that sort of thing. I don't think, by the way, the seats are happening for next year, from what I've heard. Certainly not what seat and ticket holders are being told from what Rob I've Rob Williams told. is just despondent with this news, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But you know that there are there are elements you know there are things in that arena that are going to need to get replaced. Like the like the, the ice plant is the original ice plant. Like it's coming to the end of its functional life. Like they're going to have to deal with that. They have to deal with the refrigeration pipes under under the the rink, as I understand. You know there is a new scoreboard coming for next year because that scoreboard literally hit the wall last year last season mm. multiple times. There's a new scoreboard coming. Um, they're going to have. I've been told they're going. You know they're going to have to. I mean, people have seen the leaks walking around the concourse but they're going to, they're stuck. They're going to have to deal with the roof. You know, like there's a lot of, there's sort of a, there's a revitalization that's going to happen, I think in a slow process here, but certainly that rink as it stands is going to be that. And, you know, I think they still dream ownership. And I, I understand why they still dream of a future where the viaducts are not next to them and they can actually build out some of the, some, and Rob's, I mean, this has been Rob's thing is talking about the concourses, but like, he's not yeah. wrong, you no. know, and that, and that has knock on effects for team offices and all that kind of thing. And we were still obviously in the universe. We've talked about, I think we'll probably talk about this for every week through the rest of time. Yeah. Well, where, and, where is the practice look, rink going to go? But I don't know. I don't have an answer. It's got to go across the street, for God's sakes. Yeah, like, it is some of the only unused land in downtown Vancouver, and it would make the absolute most sense yeah. uh, for the club. And, well, and look, with regards to the arena, and, and it, just before anybody thinks that we're shitting on it, Blake and I have both said it has really stood up yes. to the test of time better than most. Yeah, the concourses are too narrow because of the small footprint of the building. Yes, the seats now have to be changed. The video board has to be changed. You'd like to think That's it's not leaking and that, there's yeah. Not, yeah. and that there's not vermin running through, you know, between the seats. But other than that, and I don't mean that ironically, uh, it is a, a pretty good facility. And, yes, that is exactly what's going to be incumbent <laughs> On the Aquilinis, because as Mayor Sim staff said, I mean, that's just a losing file for any politician that and, we're going to put what, public money into a new re- arena for the billionaire Canucks owners who, let's face it, are not exactly uh, teeming with goodwill and charm. No, I, and I, but I will say to their credit, they have done smart things in the buildings. You know, in terms of in terms of bars and food and stuff like that, like that. Yeah, yeah. That's part, they've done yes. that very, very well. And and so you know, there's an ability to do it. Like the rest of it's going to have to happen. But yeah, it's it's a building that's stood up really well. I mean, it's a credit yeah. to its construction. It's credit to the Griffiths family who built it originally and planned it out. Um, you know, I as part of that that practice ring story that I did last week, I actually talked to Arthur and I said, you know, did you guys have a a time? Like, how long was this? As you were expecting to stand? He goes, he didn't really. He said. No, I mean, look at MSG. He literally said, "Look at Madison Square Garden." Uh, you know, as we understand it, the 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 frame of that building is the original building built in, built in the original in the mid '60s. You know, yeah. they've had there was a billion dollar renovation a decade ago, but that was partly because of a whole bunch of other stuff. Happening Hopefully, seismic it. upgrades, PJ. Yeah, Hopefully size. but but <laughs> the point is, is that you know, basically, this building can stand as long as the concrete is good and everything seems fine. It's just you know, there's stuff in between that's going to need some fixes and. And yeah. it, it's going to be a good, it, it can be a top end facility again. It was once it's getting, it is getting old. Um, 
but the whole league has, you know, the most league has arenas around this age. And, and there are some, there have been some very nice refurbishments. I mean, I was there at the beginning of the season in Philly, which is an arena that's like a year younger, um, in Washington, it's a year or two younger. I mean, both those arenas have had a really nice refurbishments and there's no reason that can't happen here. Draft lottery is coming up. U uh, 18s uh, put a, a spotlight on a lot of the draft eligibles for this uh, upcoming <laughs> season. Um, uh, of course, it also put a spotlight on draft eligibles for 2024 <laughs> and made Macklin Celebrini a household name. Yes. Uh, it's it's going to be Bedard this year. It's going to be Celebrini next year, you would think. Yeah. Um, with Cole Eiserman maybe not too far behind. Uh, these are two effectively North Van Vancouver kids. Yeah. Who desperately, who now name check the Canucks is, <laughs> is places that they want to – like it. Is this is painful for a Canucks fan? These are two kids who would die to be Canucks, and yeah. they will not be. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, I found myself thinking a little bit. I mean, I noted it in my story they wrote on the weekend. We had when Max celebrated, gave JD Burke credit to JD, credit yeah. to lead prospects for sending uh, sending their guys to the places they need to be. Um, JD asked him, and he said, "I mean, I asked him. I said, how did that go?" He goes. I just lit, it was literally an open ended question. The kid yeah. just kind of doubled down. Like I want to, I love the Canucks. I want to play. And yeah, I know if they were rebuilding, it would help me get there. But I also just think they should rebuild. They need to build <laughs> to be a contender. You know, that was That's essentially awesome. the take. And and um, yeah, you know, and I, I as I noted in my story, I mean. <laughs> I, I think the kid maybe knows a little bit about how things go here. His dad worked here after all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, who knows what feelings he really has about how things have played out in Fortress Canuck. But uh, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, this is a kid that uh, certainly, you know, pays attention. I mean, he, he hasn't lived in Vancouver, you know, since what, 2017, 2018? Like any kid in the business, you know, he gets shipped around. But, yeah. you know, well, no, but also because his dad ends up in, in yeah, the, singles, the singles. area, right? Yeah. So he was playing, you know, play. You go look at his, his play age. He played, you know, sort of San Jose, the San Jose Junior Sharks or whatever they're car- called. And, and then he went and played in Chicago and he's, he's going, um, he's going to BU. He's going to Boston University as a 17 year old, which is pretty impressive um, for his year before he gets drafted. I mean, he's, he's a hell of a player and he's, obviously a brilliant kid because he's playing hockey and doing all this and keeping up on his Canucks. So yeah, we'll see. I don't, as you said, like, I think it's extremely unlikely he's going to end up here as well, but uh, you know, boy, man, what a, what a hey, 3% dream. chances. Dirty you dream. never know. Uh, d- tell me, uh, d- does Abby keep going after tomorrow night? And what are you looking for there in game three? Uh, I mean, I think, I think um, if they've been able to hold on there on Saturday, uh, you know, you come back one, one, you're feeling good. You got all yeah, three at home. Yeah, you're feeling good. But, you know, a five-game series, like, mm-hmm. it's just – and Calgary, one of the best teams in the AHL this year. They got they got Dustin Wolf, who was the goalie of the year in the AHL. Like, they're a good team. I mean, they, the the Abbey Canucks have had a really good year. They played – they finished strong. Um, they 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 progressed. And there is a reason why I think uh, Patrick Alvin has been right to talk so much about what's gone in Abbotsford. I think mm-hmm. they're very happy with the progress there. Uh, but – you know, in the end, you're going to hit your sort of your limit, and I I suspect they've hit the limit here. Against Win this Calgary. one, get pods back for Friday. Box exactly. Out. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, at least we'll we'll see. You see pods. Yeah, we'll maybe. see. Yeah, we'll Brilliant, see. Patrick. Thank you. Until next Tuesday. All right, boys.